Hello and welcome to uh, semantics. In the last lecture, we talked about the type system of L1, and we just began to talk about how to implement type inference. And so we saw that the type of type inference is, some, is a function which takes in a type environment and an expression and then tells you whether the program is well typed or not. And if it is well typed, it will tell you what the type is. And the way that the type inference algorithm works is we saw that it relies on the fact that the uh, uh, typing relation has a unique type property. So if, if, if there is a type for the, for the program, there's only one possible type for it. And so that lets us write type inference as a function. And so, you know, we can write down the type inference algorithm, and then you're going to see that there is one case for every, uh, for every uh, syntactic form in the language. There's one for integers, one for Booleans, one for operators, if dereference assignment, and so on. And what the, the reason this is possible is because the typing relation is syntax directed. We had one typing rule for each syntactic form, and that means that when we implement type inference, we can implement it as a recursive function that analyzes the syntax of the function. And so what we can do is we can look at each of the cases and you can see how it works. So here for, uh, for the type inference for conditionals, what we do is we have three, three subterms, if E1, then E2, else E3. And so the way that we proceed is by checking, the, inferring the type for each of the three subterms. For We infer the type of E1, we infer the type of E2, and we infer the type of E3. And as long as the first, uh, the, the first subterm, the conditional being, the term being tested in the conditional has a Boolean type, and the types of the of the two branches, which we for E2 and E3, we want to call them T2 and T3. If those two types are equal, then we return that type, and otherwise we have a type error. So this this reflects in the typing rule how we had the uh, had the restriction that both E2 and E3 had the same type. And so in the typing rule, we wrote that equality constraint by just repeating a type variable. But up here in the in, uh, implementation, you actually have to do the equality test. So we say we got out a type T2 and a type T3 for E2 and E3, and we test that they're equal before we proceed. And again, you can look at each of the typing rules and see how it leads to the implementation. So the dereference rule says, well, you look in the context to see that that location has the type int ref, and if it does, the deref dereference expression will have the type int. And so here's what we can do. We can implement it in exactly that way. So we say we when we see the expression, Dref L in our type inference algorithm, we can look it up in the context. So we say look up in gamma the location L, and if we get back that it's an int ref, then we return the type int. And if we don't find it in the uh, in the context, then we return none. And so this corresponds to the case where the location L is not in the domain of the partial function gamma. Okay, and in fact, we can even uh, we can even run this. So what we can do is let's see what we've got here. Yeah, we can look at we can look at the infer type expression. And so right here, what we've got is a program that will set L1 to three. And now what we can, so this is what it looks like. And so when we execute do it two, what we're going to see is that it returns the type sum tie int. And in this case, it's because we've modified the assignment rule infer type of assignment, you can see right here that, oh, whoops, no, no, sorry. What happened is uh, that's the program here. Um, 
So we expected that uh, assignment would yield a unit, which it did, and then dereferencing an expression would give you uh, give, give you an integer. Um, so that's the that's one of the uh, one of the problems with trying to read things that are completely in constructor form. Uh, for small expressions, it's easy to do, but for large expressions, you can lo lose your place. So here, the the program that we're uh, we're inferring a type for is set l1 to 3 and then dereference uh, l1 and that program as you expect gets the type integer the type of integers and let's see if we can uh, we can uh, remove this uh, do it to Let's change this to doing two assignments. Let's do assign L2 integer zero. And so this program here, do it, which I'm calling do it three, is going to, is going to represent the program L1 gets set to 3, and then it's followed by L2 is set to 0. And we expect this program not to type check because the, the uh, type environment for locations only contains a, uh, only, it only contains a binding for L1. So let's try do it 3. And what happened? And we got that we got out the uh, we got out the result none, which means this program failed the type check. And if we had changed it to set L one twice, then we will expect it to type check. And we expect it to have the type unit. Let's see if our expectations are correct. Indeed, it has the type unit. So we can we can implement type inference, and it's a uh, it's it often has a reputation as a very mystical thing. But it, for simple languages, it's actually not that difficult to implement. Um, it's a we can even see the whole. Uh, We can see the whole. Uh, we can see the whole uh, function basically on one is one page of code. Well, a little bit more than one page of code. All right. So, the uh, the one additional fact about L one, which is uh, uh, which is uh, which may be of interest, is that. L1 has been chosen to be a subset of standard ML. So if you're given a fragment of, uh, if you're given an L1 program, what you can do is you can write some code to initialize the locations. So you, we can say here, here is a, a set of locations to initialize the store from L1 to LK to the numbers N1 to NK. And then if you execute E, if you execute e that L1 program is actually a subset of the syntax of standard ML. Okay, and so now one thing I, wanna, I want to uh, point out now that we've seen how to specify a type system is the question of whether we should specify a type system at all. And uh, because, of course, a, uh, a, uh, um, a programming language is fundamentally an interface between a human and a computer. And the needs of the human, the desires of the human, need to be taken into account. Um, and so, you know, there are various reasons that people will object to type systems, like perhaps they can't, they might say they can't write the uh, code they want in, uh, in a type correct fashion. And this is often but not always false. So uh, if you if you have a, a modern typed language, so if you have type polymorphism, generally, you can write the write the programs that you want, not always, um, but uh, but usually. Um, some people say that uh, when you're doing exploratory programming, 
they prefer to have types. They prefer not to have types because you don't know what the program should be. And if you want to run bits of code and see what happens, then uh, um, then it's uh, making sure that every exploratory program is type correct can be a bit of a pain. And um, this, you know, this this is uh, not a complaint that you can argue with because. Uh, um, because after all, we're talking about someone is expressing their preference. But what you can do if you are implementing a typed language is you can exploit the uh, the type information to improve the quality of ID uh, of IDE uh, support. So if you have the ability to uh, to help programmers do things like quickly rename or refactor uh, refactor your program, or like find the type of an expression as your cursor moves over it. These kinds of things will uh, will alleviate this complaint. And in fact, the benefits for refactoring are sufficiently strong that even untyped languages like uh, like JavaScript uh, have been steadily steadily moving towards uh, typed variants like TypeScript. But again, you know, this is not the sort of thing that uh, the sort of complaint that you can alleviate without doing the work when you're a uh, when you're a language designer. Um, other people, and so the verbosity and incomprehensibility of error messages. Again, these are sort of a quality of, of implementation, uh, uh, a quality of implementation issue. So, um, so. From my perspective, and re remember that I'm a type theorist, I think that uh, in general, it, it should be possible to make typed languages that uh, that are comfortable to program in. But if your users are complaining that it's not, then that's a that's a serious that's an indication you have to take uh, you have to take seriously. Um, so, so I'm going to tell you all the wonderful things about uh, types in this in this course, um, and even more in the part two course type systems, but you know, fundamentally, languages are a interface between a, a, a human programmer and a machine. And if uh, your type system, which is supposed to make life better for them, makes them complain, then that's a that's a, uh, a, a strong signal to language designers and language implementers. OK. So we've talked about uh, we've talked about type systems, and we've repeatedly mentioned that there are important properties of these of these type systems. So for of and in fact of these reduction relations in general. So for instance, we talked about how the uh, uh, reduction relation was deterministic. We've we've talked about how um, the typing relation satisfies a unique typing property, and we've stated that the language is type safe and how do we know these things are true? So in the, they all seem intuitive if you look at the if you look at the rules, but um, intuition can can easily be wrong. So especially with a with a type system, what you're arguing is that the system is uh, consistent with itself. And if you think, okay, what happens when uh, two bits of your language interact with each other? You're talking about uh, sort of a quadratic blow up in the number of interactions you need to consider, and um, when you have this kind of large scale explosion, then it's very difficult for people to to consistently look at, a, at an entire to consistently survey a large number of cases. And so by doing a proof, you can you can convince yourself and other people that you actually have have considered all the cases and that the cases you didn't consider couldn't possibly have happened. And so the other benefit of like actually doing a proof is that you were making definitions and a proof of, of a theorem is a way of actually using the definitions in a way that will stress test them and it will debug the definitions. Um, and most of the definitions of this course are inductive definitions. So we've given sets of rules that say a a uh, say a uh, addition operation is in the well typing relation if its two subterms are uh, are well typed. And so we build up facts about a program starting from the roots um, all the way up. And so to prove things about these kinds of inductive definitions, we need induction principles. So the sorts of induction that you've already seen in uh, in uh, discrete mathematics is 
the way that you can prove facts about natural numbers by mathematical induction. So we have, uh, we have number, natural numbers, and then natural number induction lets you prove things about it. And so what we can do is we're going to uh, extend this notion of, uh, of induction to two, two additional forms of induction. So when we have grammatical expressions like L1 expressions, we'll, we'll show how you can give an induction principle for, uh, for all the terms generated by a grammar by means of what's called structural induction. And we'll also show, uh, we'll generalize this further to show how uh, um, we can prove things about all the elements of a relation defined by rules, such as the transition relation or the typing relation, by means of what is called rule induction. And what we're going to see is that we have these three forms of induction to prove things about things in three different cases, but fundamentally they all boil down to proving facts about cer about certain tree shapes. So we'll we'll prove things by saying, okay, if facts hold about the subtrees of a tree, then they hold about the larger tree. And so if you remember, the principle of mathematical induction says that um, for any property of the natural number, so for any logical formula involving the natural number x, if you want to prove for all x in natural numbers, phi of x, what you can do is you can prove this universally quantified formula for every x phi of x by proving by using the principle of mathematical or natural number induction. And so what you do is you say, prove this formula for zero and prove that if the formula holds for some phi of x, then it holds for phi of x plus one. And so the idea is that this is a kind of bootstrapping process. You prove that the induction holds for zero, and then you show that for any number, if it holds for that number, it holds for a number one bigger. So therefore it's going to hold for, you can use this to get it for phi zero, and with phi zero, you can use this, this proof to prove it for phi of one, and then with that phi of one, you can prove it for phi of two, and so on and so on for any number you like. And so, therefore, if you can prove the, uh, the formula for, for zero, and you can prove that assuming it for x lets you prove it for x plus one, you get it for any x. So here's like a, a simple example where we show that uh, if you sum up the numbers from one to x, the, for, the, uh, the the, uh, the total sum is going to be x times x plus one divided by two. And what we'll do is we'll take this formula as the formula we do induction on. And if you go look at the lecture notes, you'll see that there's a, a model structure for inductive proofs. So writing a clear proof structure um, it is helpful even in tiny little cases like this, um, and it w becomes essential when things get more complicated. You you have to use the formalism to get things right, um, and in fact, we can even we can even do that proof right now, so you can, so that you can see what it looks like. So what we want to do is we want to prove. So the theorem we want to prove is that uh, uh, for all natural numbers n, or I used x, for all natural numbers x, we want the sum uh, 1 to x to equal x times x plus 1 divided by, divided by 2. And so the way that we prove this is by induction. And recall that the induction principle says that to prove a formula by induction, you prove it for the base case of zero and for the case uh, that if it, if it holds for a number, it holds for one greater. And before we do this, what it's always helpful to do is to write down what you are doing induction on. And so what we'll do in this case is we'll take our formula that we're doing induction on to be this very thing. And so now what we do is we're going to have two cases. We're going to have the case x is equal to zero. And now what you can do is you can write that you want to show uh, 
so, uh, the formula at zero, and this is going to equal the, the summing the numbers from one to zero, which is equal to zero, and we want to show that this is uh, equal to zero times zero plus one divided by two. And, ob and in this case, like by, by, by arithmetic, um, this, is, uh, this is obviously going to be zero, um, since any number multiplied by zero is going to be zero. And now for the for the successor case, we're going to say, okay, let's say x is equal. We we write this as okay for the successor case. We want to show that uh, what this holds in the case uh, um, so uh, the case uh, in the successor case. And so what we're trying to do. So in this case, what we're secretly trying to do is we're trying to show that uh, for all n psi of n implies psi of n plus 1. And the way that this is conventionally written is that we're trying to prove a universally quantified formula, and we're assuming something, and then we're trying to prove the conclusion. And so what people will do is they'll say, OK, well, in the, in the successor case, we're going to assume that we have some number. Uh-oh, something strange is happening. So in the successor case, we're going to assume we have some natural number. And then what we're going to do is we're going to assume, further assume, we're going to suppose that uh, uh, psi of n holds. And so what this means is we're going to assume because we're we're trying to we're trying to prove this so here's our here's our goal and what we're trying to prove is we're to prove this universal quantification, we assume we have an arbitrary n, and then to prove this implication, we assume that psi of n holds. And now, uh, what we're going to do is we are going to try to show, want to show, that uh, psi of n plus 1 holds. And so th what this is going to be is we want to show that this expression right here is equal to this one right here. And so this, this fact you can prove by just doing a bit of, uh, by, doing some, uh, uh, by doing some algebraic manipulations. You can, you, can, you can do this. So what will happen is we can say, all right, uh, this thing is equal to this, and this is going to be equal to uh, n times n plus 1 over 2 uh, plus 2n plus 1 over 2, and then after some more arithmetic, You'll, you'll get the result that you want. You'll be able to show you will be able to show this uh, this uh, this result, and that's that's how we establish establish the proof by induction. But the key point is that we choose an induction hypothesis and then we prove it in two cases: one for the zero case and one for the successor case. And so we lay out each of these cases, and then it's easy for a reader to check that your proof is correct. And 
the now the question is like how do we prove things about all expressions so like say determinacy for l1 and so in l1 we said that if the if a configuration es takes a transitions to e1 s1 and we also have a derivation saying that es transitions to e2 e, s2 then e1 s1 has to equal e2 s2 and the point is that we the way we proceed is by making all the universal quantifiers explicit so for all e s e1 s1 e2 s2 uh, then you can say if es takes one transition and another transition the resulting configurations are equal and now with this what we can do is we can note that we're starting to we're asserting a formula that ranges over all expressions and the way that expressions are generated is by means of a grammar so we say that expressions are generated from this bnf grammar so liter boolean literals operators conditionals um, assignment and dereference sequencing while expressions that's how we that's how we write down expressions, and every expression is generated by means of these uh, of these forms. So if you see an e op e, say e plus e prime, well, you know for a fact that its subterms e and e prime were also generated by this grammar. And so what we get is a tree structure. So if you see an expression like uh, if L is greater than zero, then skip else set L, uh, L to zero. Um, so this is sort of a clamping function. The way you can think about it is, it might, you might think of it in your text buffer as a list of characters. Um, and then when you feed it to a compiler, it'll go through two passes. First, this will get tokenized. Um, so we'll get a sequence of tokens like a con uh, uh, if deref loc l greater than or equal to just a list of tokens um, rather rather than a sequence of characters and then what the parser will do is it'll turn this into an abstract syntax tree so you have a root node which is a conditional and this conditional node will have three subterms greater than or equal to skip semicolon and then a than a sequence of two smaller expressions. So if you recall the ML code, the ML code represented your program as a tree, and that's exactly what the parser does. It takes this list of characters, um, feeds it to a tokenizer, which gives you a list of tokens, and then the tokenizer is fed to a parser, which yields this into abstract syntax tree, which is your ML data structure. And so once you have your ML data structure, um, so your abstract syntax tree, lots of lots of issues no longer have to be considered. The parser tells you exactly how to do things like how to associate expressions and things like this. So one plus two plus three will get uh, a definite parenthesization. And so uh, um, one, uh, uh, one, one convention that that's typically used is when we write programs on slides, we stick in parentheses in order to uh, disambiguate the, 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 the sequence. Um, it's not like f a formal construct in the abstract syntax tree. It's just to help you decide whether to left associate or right associate this, uh, this binary tree. Okay. And so we have, we have decided that programs are really going to be trees, that we, the way we think about programs is trees. And if we think about them as trees, how do we prove properties about this family of trees that's generated by a grammar? And so what we can do is we can take a generalization of the idea of natural number induction. So for natural number induction, we said, well, numbers are generated from zero and successor. And so that means we can prove a universal property by, by showing that it holds for zero and then showing that if it holds for a value, it holds for the successor. And so we can do the, the same thing here. We can say that for each tree constructor that takes zero or more arguments, we can show that if a property holds for each of the subtrees, then it holds for the larger tree. So now what we can do is we can show that um, if for each tree constructor C, um, you have 
the, a, a property that holds for each of the subterms. So we show that uh, we, if you have a K array constructor and you have K expressions for which this property holds, um, you're able to show that the property holds for the, for the larger tree. Um, if you can show that works for every constructor, it works for every expression. So let's take a look. So for L1, um, it's enough to show that a property phi holds for each of the nullary constructors. So you want to show that it holds for skip for each of the booleans. You want to show that it holds for phi of b. For each of the numbers, you want to hold it, show that it holds for phi of n. And so what we're doing is we're ranging over the base constructors of the, of the language. So for locations, you want to show that the property holds for every dereference expression. For now we, get, now we come to the place where it starts looking a bit like induction. So now we've established the property holds for all the nullary constructors. And then for the unary operations, like say assignment, what we're going to do is we're going to show that for every location and every expression, if the property phi holds for the expression, it will, we want to show that it holds for the assignment expression. Phi of L gets assigned to E. And so you can see that each grammatical form is getting this kind of, uh, if the property holds for the subterms, it'll hold for a larger expression. So for um, sequencing, say, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we want to prove a property for every expression. So in the case that the expression is a, is a, uh, um, a sequencing, we'll say, well, okay, can we show that for any E1 and E2, which satisfy this property, the property holds for the sequencing expression. And likewise for a ternary expression like conditionals, if you want to show that it, if you can show that a property holds for E1, E2, and E3 with this phi1, phi2, and phi3, we want to show that it holds for the conditional expression. So when you do something, when you do a proof by structural induction, you're proving something about a grammatical expression. And the way that you do this is you take the formula that you want to hold for all expressions, and you show that it holds for each of the base cases, and you show that it holds for each of the uh, term constructors, the unary ones, the binary ones, the ternary ones, all the way up. And so you get one clause per clause in the BNF grammar. And so now what you can do is you can prove determinacy. And so if we wanted to prove determinacy, we could prove this by doing structural induction on the expression E. And so now here, here's, like, uh, here's like something that is um, less, uh, might be a little bit less familiar to you. Recall that the formulas, uh, a proof by structural induction says, okay, so for every expression in the language of L1, show that some formula phi of E holds. And though, because the statement of determinacy has lots of quantifiers in it, so for all E, S1, E1, S1, E2, S2, that formula that we're going to do in, we're going to establish by induction is also going to have a bunch of quantifiers in it. So here, this formula phi is going to have, you know, this whole stack of quantifiers for all s, e prime, s prime, e double prime, s double prime. Now we can show that if e s goes to e prime, s prime, and e s goes to e double prime, s double prime, then uh, e prime, s prime will, is going to be equal to e double prime, s double prime. So if there's two transitions from e s, the resulting configurations are always the same. And we can show this by structural induction and in each inductive case. So like in the unary case, the binary case, the thing you get as an uh, induction hypothesis is going to be a universally quantified formula. So what you will get is we will, we want to prove this by induction on E. And so that gives us something like one proof obligation for each of the constructors in the language. We have to prove this for trip, uh, skip, for the Booleans, for numeric literals, for dereference, 
for assignment, for operators, sequencing, while loops, and conditionals. And so uh, your proof, when you do the proof by uh, structural induction, will have one case for each grammatical form. Okay. And so you'll uh, so what we'll show is that you'll you'll get quite a quite a large proof you'll have to you'll have to write a lot in order to establish this determinacy proof um, and the reason is that an operational semantics can be quite large um, okay but let's look at maybe one one or two of the cases in lecture and then we'll move on to uh, to talking about how uh, how it works so let's take a look at maybe the uh, the uh, determinacy case for, for assignment. Um, so what you can do is you can say, okay, well, suppose you're doing an assignment. Um, what will happen is that when you, uh, when you try to do this proof, let's do determinacy. So determinacy is saying that for all, uh, for all E, S, E1, S1, E2, S2, if E, S goes to E1, S1, and E, S goes to E2, S2, then E, E1 equals E2, and S2 equals S2, S1 equals S2. And so we prove this by induction, by structural induction on the expressions. And so now we're going to get one case for each grammatical form. So now we have a case, L is set to some uh, E prime. And so now here's the case that we've got. So what we've got is our formula is going to equal this thing right here. So our induction hypothesis, our induction formula, is going to be a formula that says, that has a, a massive set of quantifiers over, uh, over, a, uh, uh, over all, the, all the results. And then we prove that if you can take two steps, then you get the same result. And so when we, you'll have one proof case for each grammatical form. And in this case, what we really have is we want to show that uh, um, for all L E prime, if uh, psi of E prime, then psi of L gets assigned to E prime. And now we can assume we have our L and our E prime and that we have psi of E prime. And these, these sets of these, these two quantifiers, the L and the E prime are, are typically written as case L is E prime. And now what we've done is we're implicitly, uh, we're implicitly choosing L, uh, we're implicitly assuming that L and E prime are these arbitrary, uh, are these uh, um, arbitrary choices of L and expression. Um, so this is something you'll see in the lecture notes. And what's happening is um, like a convention that makes these proofs a little bit easier to read. But if you don't know the convention, it can be uh, it can be a little bit surprising. So we've assumed these, and now what we've what we've got is we've got our goal is psi of uh, L gets set to E prime. And so what this is, is it's going to be, so our, our induction hypothesis is this thing right here. And our goal is this, which is going to be um, that that if uh, L gets set to E prime goes to E1 and L gets set to E prime goes to S2, then this whole thing here. So 
when you have a goal like this, uh, which is a universally quantified formula, what you want to do is you want to uh, assume that you have all of these uh, all of these things so this is choosing some arbitrary s e1 s1 e2 s2 and you're also going to we're also going to assume since we're trying to prove an implication we're going to assume e that these two transitions occur and then our goal will become uh, simply this and so now what we're going to do is we're going to assume or suppose, or something, or postulate. You'll see. You'll see all of these in mathematical English. And so now, your our goal is to prove that e1 equals e2 and s1 equals s2. And so now, here is where we're going to uh, use our uh, our uh, um, our uh, our uh, our our derivations. So when you, whenever we see a reduction rule, we know that the reduction rule is going to be generated from a where we know we we have. So we ha we we have that. Uh, L assigned to E prime steps to E E one S one and because we know this we know that it's it comes from some derivation tree and so that means that we have a derivation tree that looks like the following we're going to have a derivation tree that ends in that ends in um, in an assignment for, and there are two rules that end in an assignment. So, you know, rule one will say that uh, <coughs> um, E prime S will go to some E double prime S double prime. And then this uh, then what we'll learn here is, and so if, if this is the rule that happens, so the congruence rule for assignment, then, so I, then what will happen is that this, this, this thing is really L gets set to E double prime, S double prime, and so we, now we know that L gets set to E double prime, S double prime is actually equal to E1, S1. And so now in this case, um, we, also know, we also know the same thing about the S2 case. Uh, so we have our two derivation trees. And so what we what we've what we've learned uh, is let me write this with a triple. Because we we don't know that these things are equal yet. So what we've learned you know, is that if e prime takes a step, then we're we're going to have two derivation trees, um, one where e prime s prime goes to e triple prime s triple prime, and one where it goes to e double prime s double prime, and then it takes another step. And now what we can do because of these uh, because these two uh, these two things look alike is we can use our induction hypothesis by giving it the E prime the S um, and uh, we have the E prime we have the S we have the E double prime the S double prime the E triple prime the S triple prime and so our we can use this induction hypothesis right here and instantiate all of these quantifiers so instantiate psi of e with uh, s e double prime s double prime e triple prime s triple prime and um, and then we uh, we get so 
So we get that if uh, e prime s goes to e double prime s double prime and e prime s prime goes to e triple prime s triple prime then e double prime equals e triple prime and s double prime equals s triple prime and because we know from these uh, from from these two assumptions that e prime s prime goes to e double prime s double prime and we know that e double prime s and goes to e triple prime s triple prime so therefore we get uh, yeah, let me let me actually label these. Therefore, from one and two, we get this, and this is exactly what we wanted to show. And so now, what we've got, you can see how this how this proof goes. We assumed a property of the subterms. We looked at the derivation tree for for each of these reductions, and that gave us an additional fact, which let us. Uh, um, which let us uh, show that the uh, that the goal that we actually wanted that the reduction is deterministic actually holds. Okay, and so what we can do when we uh, when we prove this is actually we can we'll when we when we go through this proof you'll see that I I slightly palmed a card I said oh yes if you see l goes to e prime and we get this case then the other one has to has to be the same case but we can ask well what if this were a value so what if we said l goes to e prime s goes to you know, skip uh, S2. And then the question is like, why do we know that uh, both of these reductions for E for, uh, for ES, why, why do they both either use the congruence rule or both use the assignment rule? And the reason is that values don't reduce. So we have four cases. Um, so both values, both uh, both congruence, or the two cross cases, and the two cross cases don't happen because values don't reduce. And again, this is something that you prove by uh, uh, by <clears throat> by just looking at the by looking at the uh, uh, reduction relation. So if e is a value, then it's a numeral, and then you look at each of the rules and you see that there is no r rule of the f uh, of the form. Uh, E s goes to e prime s prime when uh, when the first thing is uh, is a uh, is a value, and so then you use this lemma, and that lets you rule out the cross cases. And so we get, well, let me write this here. This is subcase. Both reduce, and we will have one more subcase. Both step, and the cross cases. Are impossible because values don't reduce. Okay, and so that's that's sort of the shape of the proof. And so, what we've what we've seen is that uh, um, we I relied on the fact that oh yes if uh, if we ended in a rule, then we had this premise rule, and what we what we want is. Uh, we uh, we were doing sort of a case analysis on the last rule that 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 we used in the derivation, and so what we can see is uh, that th this this property that I appealed to is what's called an inversion property. So what we did was we said okay. Um, we had this assignment statement, and then there were two possibilities. I said, either either this uh, this for the assignment, either we use the value we we did a value assignment, or we are doing a uh, a congruence step. And this is also a lemma that we needed to prove. Um, so the the one of the uh, inversion lemmas is going to say that uh, you know that. Uh, if you see L gets assigned to E steps to something, then there are going to be two possibilities. Um, either it's going to be 
So we're going to, we can state the inversion lemma here. So, or one of them really. So if L gets assigned to E, S goes to um, some expression E prime, then either uh, E prime is equal to L gets set to E double prime and um, E S goes to E, pri e double prime S prime or uh, um, e prime is equal to some number, uh, e is equal to some number n, so, or that is e prime, oh yeah, e, e prime is equal to skip, and e is equal to n. Or, or, yeah, so we get these two cases, and these two, these two properties arise from the fact that we have two reduction rules for uh, uh, for for the uh, for the step for the for the assignment rule. So we've got uh, E S goes to E prime S prime. So this is one of the assignment rules, and the other assignment rule says that uh, we go to skip S prime. where uh, this is going to be s plus uh, l to n. So we've got these two rules. And so what we'll be able to show is, as an in inversion lemma, is that if we see this step, then either we get uh, So, so if we if we see this if we see this reduction rule, then the only two rules that could have applied were these two possible uh, these two possible uh, reduction rules. And if it's the first case, then we get uh, we get that there is an e prime that this uh, that if this rule if this rule were the one that happened, then e prime has to be an assignment statement e double prime blah 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 let me let me make this match um, and so we can we can sort of match this expression against this result and that's going to tell us that the uh, uh, result is going to be an assignment and we're going to uh, we're going to get this or we're going to we're, or we'll be able to say that you know if it were the actual thing that did the actual assignment then the resulting expression is a skip and the st the store gets updated in the in the right way and so that's how you prove all of these inversion lemmas um, and so all of these determinacy proof uh, details are in the notes and now um, you know, having proved these nine things, we can actually look at an, another example. So if you dereference L, add to it, and then add three, then you can see why this holds. Um, so here, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to show the way that the reason that determinacy holds is that when you evaluate uh, an addition expression, we know that the two subterms will evaluate in a deterministic way. And so that means that in particular that this L1 plus L2 is going to evaluate deterministically. And that's going to evaluate deterministically because the dereference operation acts deterministically. And so the, the point is that uh, um, these, these kinds of proofs look like you're you're doing a surgery on trees because actually you are we're taking properties that start at the at the roots and pushing them upwards so we know that l bang l evaluates deterministically and we know there's nothing to do for the for the two case and that means that addition has to uh, evaluate deterministically because there's only uh, two rules for uh for well three rules for addition the thing that actually does the work the evaluate the rule the 
the expression on the left and the evaluate the expression on the right, and only one of those rules can ever apply. And so that means that addition evaluates deterministically, and then again at the at the next level up, we're able to show that the this larger expression evaluates deterministically. So again, this this expression will evaluate deterministically. And so in the next level lecture, we'll carry on with how proofs by rule induction work, and um, then we will we will be able to prove everything that we need to prove in this course. Thank you.